This is a lecture from Open Tuition. We're going to be looking at an exam for AAA, uh, a question in the exam, in the specimen exam. You will need to have a look at the question before listening to this recording. You can find a PDF of the question on the Open Tuition website. So if you're watching this on YouTube, go to Open Tuition, find our resources for AAA, and there you'll find a PDF of the question. Before you start to listen to the debrief, I'd recommend you probably spend an hour working through the question a couple of times, just so you have a good understanding of where everything is coming from. I'm going to be thinking about how the marks are allocated, exam technique, and in particular mention the professional marks which are awarded as part of this question. We can see an analysis of the requirements here. So there are three requirements. To evaluate audit risk for 25 marks, to produce audit tests on one specific risk, segmental information, five marks, and to evaluate whether we could supply an extra service giving advice on social and environmental information, 10 marks. A further 10 marks are then allocated for professional skills. We'll highlight them as we go through but that's essentially communication, which I've abbreviated to COM, analysis and evaluation, which I've abbreviated to AE, professional skepticism and judgment, which I've again abbreviated to PSJ, and finally, commercial acumen or CA. So we'll take ourselves through the question step by step, and I'll talk about the way in which my brain would work if I was attempting this question. So you will have had a look at the requirements, realise the first part is on audit risk, and the first thing that we need to do is just say, well, if a question is on audit risk, what sort of thing would we find in it? So before I even start to look at the scenario in any detail, my knowledge says that audit risk can exist at the financial statement level. For example, so the whole set of accounts can be affected if the business is not a going concern or if they have very weak internal controls or there are indicators for fraudulent financial reporting like profit-related pay, um, a proposed listing of the company. As it happens, when you come to read this scenario, in fact, I know one division is in a mess, but it's certainly still a going concern. Weak internal controls do come out though, and because I'd thought about that, I can then highlight it in my risks. I'm not sure I saw incentives for fraudulent reporting, but by thinking about it up front, I'm looking for those factors when I come to write my answer. Audit risk also exists at the balance or transaction level, and you're more familiar with this. It's where you end up with sentences saying under or overstatement of PPE or receivables or whatever, or non-disclosure of related party transaction or segmental information. So if you haven't learnt that brainstorm before the exam, learn it because that just sets the scene and you know what you're then looking for. In this question I think there are some easy marks. They give clues that they want you to determine materiality when you read the requirement so actually determining it will get you two marks. In addition it will count towards your credit for analysis and evaluation, and professional skills and judgment, 
I'm not saying it's getting you another two marks necessarily, but it's certainly counting towards those marks. So that will be a very easy thing to do. Take the profit, work out five to 10% of profit, and then, well, you probably say there are some control issues, so we'd go closer to the 5%. So you might end up by saying, materiality is set at 5% of profit, which is 4 million or whatever. So that's an easy way to pick up more than two marks. Using relevant tra trends and ratios, every time you use one, well, certainly for a couple of marks, then they're going to get half a mark each on the assumption they're being used in your briefing notes. So increase in revenue, change in gross profit margin, getting half a mark, each. Um, but don't please produce a page of ratios. There's no point in showing workings because the gross profit margin is what it is. And if you think it's something else, it just isn't. Again, the fact that you are calculating ratios that are relevant to your answer will again count towards your credit for analysis and evaluation. Communication marks only given in question one in the real exam, but very easy to pick them up here. Short introduction, how much would I say? I would say these briefing notes prioritize, um, evaluate audit risks um, on this client. They also set out audit procedures on segmental reporting and suggest evaluate whether we should provide additional services on social environmental information advice full stop probably two sentences there and that's plenty to get your introduction that's plenty you don't need a conclusion um the other thing subheadings very important so a subheading for materiality a subheading for each audit risk, so revenue, PPE, or whatever. Occasionally, you're going to miss one. It's not the end of the world, but as far as possible, try and be conscious of putting subheadings in. Something that counts towards your communication skills is that you obey the instruction. This is a question about audit risk. So if you start ranting on about business risk, well, you're not going to get that communication mark. So you'll be getting no marks for saying what the business risks are, because that's all a different question. And you're certainly not getting the communication mark for sticking to the requirement. Very important. So easy marks in this question, little bit of calculation used in the right place. Now, what do we do in terms of discussing the audit risks? How do we get to those audit risks? Your brain is ready. It's geared. You know the sort of thing that you're going to go for, but everything in that brainstorm. But what I then need to do is to drive my audit risks out of the scenario as far as possible in the time allowed. So please... This is not an answer. I'll show you part of an answer later. It's really just showing you how your brain should be operating. The examiner says up to three marks for audit risk, um, each of them, if you've done it properly. It is a new client. To me, that's not the most significant thing since they invented sliced bread. So the fact you highlight it's a new client is certainly not going to get you three marks. But all I've done is to link the words in the scenario to audit risk. So I'll show you a written answer or part of it in just a minute, but this is the way my brain works. In the Sunseeker division, they had been upgrading and maintaining the ships. And it specifically said, 
maintenance, which clearly is a P&L thing, and new entertainment, facilities, I suppose a theatre, which is therefore something that would go into the balance sheet. Risk then, isn't it, is that they might capitalise revenue expenditure. So they might actually add the cost of the revenue expenditure, the maintenance, into the cost of the asset. Risk of overstatement of PPE. We saw that the explorer ships, the construction company, had a chairman in common. You make the link Related party transactions must be disclosed. There's the risk. Use the words from the related party standard. Key management, control and so on. And say that we must disclose the relationship and the transaction. Loans to construct new ships. Well, They gave you the interest rate. They gave you the amount of the cost. So we could work out the finance cost as a percentage of profit, just to say it's material. That's got to count towards our analysis and evaluation, Mark. Risk, clearly. Non-capitalisation of finance cost on a qualifying asset. So IES 23, you must capitalise the costs on assets that take some time to construct, risk of um, understatement of PPE. When you look at the right-hand column, if you're saying that your financial reporting knowledge is dodgy, you need to do something about that. I recommend you go to our website, Open Tuition, go to the flashcards for SBR, There are a hundred and practice them a hundred times until you're confident you cannot get through this exam without the SBR knowledge. If for some reason you've not sat the SBR exam, well, learn the flashcards and that will sort it out. A hundred of them a hundred times for a hundred days. You should be okay then. When you looked at the financials, very easy to pick up analysis and evaluation marks for noticing the change in operating margin and the change in revenue. They're not complex ratios to calculate. And with those, the audit risks are always the same. So if you haven't learnt, if you weren't familiar, learn them. If margin is up, it suggests overstatement of revenue or understatement of operating expenses. If revenue is up, it suggests overstatement of revenue. In the text, it then said that revenue is recognised when the cruise starts. I think the cruise lasts for six weeks. I can't think of anything worse, can you? Anyway, the cruise lasts for six weeks. So they should be recognising the revenue over the period of the cruise, especially if you've got a lot of people away around the year end. So if they recognise it too early, you could say overstatement of revenue. You could say cut-off error, revenue in the wrong period. They make a big fuss with the segmental information And you need to know, again, you must know your flashcards for SBR. Again, operating segments chosen by the chief operating decision maker. And you must report segments which are more than 10% of revenue, assets or profits. Now, the onboard spend when people pay for the photographer or for drinks or using the I don't know, the spa, again, all those things, 15% of revenue. We're told it's got a different margin. That's where the company makes all its money. So if that's not being disclosed separately, misstatement of operating segment disclosures. Also, 
That's professional skills and judgment. I'm sorry, professional skepticism and judgment, isn't it? Because you're challenging the information. That's professional skepticism. If you're given depreciation and you're given the assets, just have a quick look and see if the rate looks right. You have to compare the accumulated depreciation for the two years and then whatever the difference is, divide it into the carrying amount or cost of the assets. It suggests 2%. Now, again, I don't think I'd like to go for a ship on a ship which is like 50 years old, <clears throat> not without, I'd probably take my own life jacket, I think. So commercial acumen says it sounds wrong, but in addition, you've actually challenged. So again, that's professional skepticism and judgment. In addition, you've done a calculation, analysis and evaluation. The loss of the licenses well, that's impairment of intangible assets. So risk, or I'll show you how we'd write that up in just a minute. Cyber security, link it back to these risks that affect the whole set of accounts. Because if someone's got into the system, that could be a problem anywhere in the set of accounts. So weak internal controls, I'm demonstrating professional skills and judgment. In addition, of course, the customers will be cross, the regulators will be fine, giving fining us, so potentially understatement to provisions, non-disclosure of contingent liabilities as well. Now, we do get mark credit for prioritisation I don't think you have to spend hours. It's not a university essay. You just want to make sure that you start with something that's a bit exciting. So I would not have started with new client personally. Also, don't start with something you're not confident about because that would be a terrible start. And in this one, probably revenue, we all know the rules on revenue, would be a good place to have your first heading. So find something you're confident with, something that's obviously significant. Revenue would be a good start. PPE would be a good start as well. How much do you write? That's your analysis and evaluation because you are prioritising. How much do you write for three marks? This is my example of a risk written up. The loss of operating licenses for Pioneer Cruises is an impairment indicator. I've worked out whether it's material. That's analysis and evaluation as well, isn't it? I've explained the rule they have to write down to recover amount. I've put the risk. The risk is overstatement of intangible assets. Scenario, material, accounting, risk scenario material accounting risk i do like mnemonics i think i've made one up there smar there we are s m a r you don't have to be rigidly bound by it do you but i took the scenario i said something about material i explained any accounting rules and risk you don't want all of IES 36, but you do want some of it. So there we are, SMA. Say that to someone you love later, especially if they're doing the AEA exam, SMA. Okay, there's the first part of the question. The second requirement was to have a look at procedures on segmental reporting. Five marks, five times one mark. Now, how do we get there? And people struggle massively with that. So how do we get there? And where are the marks going? Professional skill-wise, again, commercial acumen is scoring here. 
if your procedures are achievable and realistic. So if it sounds like something you could do, then you're going to get the commercial acumen as well as getting the regular mark of one per procedure. Many of you will not be in order in practice and so you panic and struggle about this. You use odd mnemonics like A-E-I-O-U seems to float around a lot, which I think helps with AA, but not so much here. So what do we do? Because you're asked usually for procedures on an accounting topic, think about what happens in the accounting standard and then test each item. So segmental, it's think about the definition of operating segment. It's something whose results are reviewed by the chief operating decision maker, which is separately reported in the management accounts, um, which engages in business activities. And then the reportable segments are 10% of revenue assets or profit. Um, that's what's in my mind when I look at this. I also know there's going to be an easy mark for challenging the directors about the audit risk that I spoke about here because we said that in the segmental disclosure we didn't think they were doing it properly because they weren't showing the on-ship uh, the on-ship um, revenue again um, separately. So we know the procedure, then that can drive out the procedures, the actual tests. On the left of my screen is my brain. On the right, it's trying to get a procedure. You have to find the chief operating decision maker. So I looked at an organization chart or board minutes to find out who they were. They then look at certain categories of information. So I need to have a look at the reports that are submitted to them to identify the operating segments. Those reports would then agree to something and management accounts is a sensible place to agree them back to because the regular nominal or general ledger might not separately show these by segment. I don't they they perhaps do. Anyway, agree the numbers back. I know I've got to do disclose things that are more than 10%. So recalculate 10% of revenue to confirm they've identified the reportable segments. Challenge this issue about onboard sales. Discuss with management. And then any time you get procedures, Always play your joker. The best audit procedure of all is analytically review. So what words do we need to fit in? Segment. So analytically review the results by segment. And you could always finish your sentence in the same way. Discuss unexpected results with management. That again, I think I've typed management, but I know you'll forgive me. But um, that would, again, put you a very comfortable score there. When you write procedures, they're going to be a bit more open with the marking if you've written other things. And don't worry if you're not getting as high a mark there um, as you are, say, on the audit risks. We do our best. But try and think about that with other processes like impairment or pensions or share-based pay. Think about the accounting in your brain and then you can probably drive out the procedures. Um, don't use the word check. You've probably been told that in books and by tutors. So if you write check, it's just going to annoy someone. Words like ensure are just going to annoy someone as well because they're not being very specific. But you, if you look at the procedures I've written on the right, I suspect we could probably go some way to actually doing them in reality. The last requirement 
asked us to think about the extra service to provide advice on social and environmental information. Marks on this, it's 10 marks, it's 10 issues, no messing about, it's one mark each. So you don't want to be writing a book the size of War and Peace. You're into the scenario and then adding on some knowledge. Now, brainstorm. Well, you'll have your own checklist probably for job acceptance questions. And I must say that my checklists change every time, but I have one before I sit the real exam. So for job acceptance, my latest one is Eric Evans slowly prepares Raita, that delicious yogurt. It's made me think I'll have some Raita for tea. Lovely Raita, Eric, say his guests. Ethical principles like objectivity, professional competence, ethical threats like self-interest, management, self-review, safeguards, they will give some marks for this and they're very easy to fit in to your answer if you see obvious safeguards. Practical issues, resources, expertise, fees. Hopefully you can see that fits in with Eric Evans' Slowly Prepares. Reputation of the client. Well, not so much to talk about here. Last auditor, completely irrelevant here. But it would be relevant, wouldn't it, in a question where we were taking over an audit assignment. Engagement risk, so being sued, being exposed again, so risk of litigation. And finally, sorting everything out at the last minute, setting out everyone's responsibilities in the engagement letter. It's a long time since I dated anyone, but again, it's very much like the checklist you probably have if you're dating someone at the moment. So make sure you speak to their last boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. Make sure you set out your responsibilities in the engagement letter. So for each of these points, what you need to do is to link something in the scenario to a piece of that knowledge. So the brainstorm you can very quickly jot down Eric Evans or whatever, just so that it reminds you what things are going to put scores on the doors. Those blue words on their own won't score anything, of course. But now we can start to link back to the scenario. So here we are. I've put some points down here. All the way through, analysis and evaluation credit is being given because you are using the information to support your discussion. Providing advice, management threat. The information will be published on the website, submitted to the regulatory authority. Engagement risk, isn't the risk of litigation if these things go wrong. Association risk, again, if the information is terribly wrong, we become associated with the company. The sorts of things that we're looking at. Water efficiency. Well, I'm quite good at deferred tax. I'm not very good at water efficiency. So that's a practical issue, isn't it? Whether we would have the expertise. So reliance on expert whatever. Charitable donations is another example. Well, We'd have the expertise, but the point is that those numbers appear in the accounts. That presents a self-review threat. It's got to be done next month. So commercial acumen credit being recognised there that we might not have the resources to do it in a month. Plus, of course, we might rush it. I've brought in the principle of professional competence and due care. Enhanced fee, well, the word is enhanced, isn't it? That definitely presents a self-interest threat. We'd be reluctant to disagree with the client. And presumably they want a sensible conclusion. So play your joker by always getting off the fence. And that's demonstrating 
professional scepticism and judgment. Again, probably on this, my conclusion would be veering to saying no. A conclusion, if you're saying we would unlikely to be able to accept, you know, that's about the right balance. I think in the, the model answer, they said it's something to discuss for the audit committee, which is a great point because it's a listed company. How much would I write for each point? Scenario, knowledge. So much shorter here. Here's an example. The information includes charitable donations. This is a self-interest threat. The most important word here is this one, because. Because the amount payable to charity will be within the financial statements. I'm getting clarity, communication, credit. I'm getting analysis and evaluation because I'm linking the knowledge, again, back to the scenario. Anytime you find you're writing down some knowledge and the sentence hasn't started with the scenario, just stop it. One, because it's not going to get any credit. And two, it's certainly not analysing and evaluating the information that you've been given. There we are. There's a review of that 50 mark question. In a recent syllabus change, this was uh, recorded in 2022, they introduced these 10 professional skills, marks. In the earlier version of the question, before they were introduced, they were giving fewer marks and asking for more technical content. There's about six marks technical content have been dropped. So you have less to write and more time to think about it. So say to someone you love, when you face these questions again, brainstorm first, what do we expect to see? I've shown you my lists for audit risk and job acceptance. Look for obvious easy marks and then link the scenario back to whatever is being asked and then AAA will just be a happy memory of the past. Thank you for listening.